Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Trollson, and I'm an instructor here with Intertech. What I'm going to be doing in this video is I'm going to be giving sort of a short version um, of our first chapter of the complete C Sharp class. And the reason that I'm going to be doing kind of a shortened format is that the full first chapter takes up a pretty good part of the first morning of the first day. Lots of demos and so forth. So I'm just going to try to give kind of a condensed version of that chapter. And what I want to do is introduce you and help you kind of get the, the big picture on the .NET platform. We'll be talking about a lot of kind of fundamental programming concepts. We'll be talking about the distinction between an assembly, a namespace, and a type. I'll kind of dig into the format of an assembly by using a couple of really useful tools like ILDASM and Reflector and of course Visual Studio. And then we'll also just kind of kick the tires on some key concepts that you might have uh, might have heard out there. So why don't we fire up PowerPoint here. Now, what I'm going to begin with might seem rather odd if you haven't played around with .NET before. I'm actually going to open with a little bit of a history lesson. Um, if you've been working with Microsoft technologies in the past, you've certainly heard of COM, the Component Object Model. I want to make sure that you understand that .NET and COM are completely different systems in pretty much every possible way. One nice thing, though, is that Microsoft does have an interoperability layer. So if you have existing ActiveX controls, COM servers, and you want to incorporate them into new, you know, maybe a Windows Forms project or a WPF project, you can do that very simply. But the reason that I want to talk a little bit about the world that was is so that you better understand why Microsoft unveiled the .NET platform some number of years ago. Now, real high level on COM, it was really just a bunch of white papers, if you get right down to it. But if you were a compiler builder and you created a COM aware compiler, you ended up building an IDE which could generate these things called uh, COM servers. Now, any COM server had these three interesting benefits. My favorite is the first little sub point here language independence. And that just simply means that you were not tied into one specific programming language. You could build COM servers in C++, Delphi, you could build it in Visual Basic. And then you could reuse these components across language boundaries. So that was a really helpful idea. We also had something called location transparency. And that's just kind of a fancy way of saying that regardless of the distance between the client program and the server component. You didn't have to change your programming model. So if you were doing a out of process call or a remote call to a different machine, you had a, a very similar programming model. And then finally, one of the things about COM that was pretty interesting, if you want to use a kind word for it, is that every single thing was based on interface based polymorphism. So if you were a C++ programmer, you had a lot of COM interfaces you had to implement. But the idea was good, you know, it gave us a very nice versioning system. Now these ideas are not abandoned in the world of .NET, but they're kind of improved upon, simplified, and made much more robust. So again, to better frame out exactly what this .NET platform is, let's just do this really quick compare contrast and look at some of the big problems that COM had. And this is coming from a person that did a lot of COM programming. So, um, I'm definitely uh, aware of these issues firsthand, and maybe you are too. The first thing about COM that was a bit of a problem, let me just put up my highlighter here, is that that whole benefit of language independence had a couple of warts. And the essential problem was that the COM type system was not very symmetrical. You know, based on which language you were using, like C++ versus Visual Basic, you would have to take some really different programming techniques to make things work seamlessly. And this was really obvious if you ever worked with string data or arrays. You might remember the dreaded safe array in the Vster. 
Well, let's see this problem firsthand, okay? You might know that a comm server typically has embedded inside of it this little binary blob of metadata, oops, which we call a type library, okay? Now, the idea of this type library is it just describes what's inside of the comm server. Type libraries are generated with a actual description language called IDL code. Okay, now this is where you don't have to worry about the syntax of IDL. Thankfully, .NET programmers never have to write this garbage anymore. But let's just take a look at this IDL code. Okay, this is something that a COM programmer might uh, begin a project with. You know, they begin by defining a single interface, and this interface has one method called speak which takes a string data type. And then imagine I've actually implemented this interface on top of a class, okay? And then I actually wrote the, the real code behind it, because remember, IDL is just describing what's in the comm server. So assuming I've written the comm server, I've compiled it all down, here's the problem. Okay, look at how wickedly different we would have to invoke that one speak method based on our comm language of choice, right? So up on top here we have good old VB6, which has nothing to do with VB.net, by the way. And here, you know, VB has always tried to hide a lot of the complexity for us. So here we don't see any trace of the underlying com subsystem, right? We just make the object, call the method, double quote the string, life is good. But down here at the bottom, this is how a C++ programmer might go ahead and call the same exact method. And now you can see a lot of little artifacts bubble up here, right? We have these COM API calls. We have to worry about managing reference counting. And here, I'm even using a helper class from ATL to help simplify my string programming. If I didn't do that, I'd have to be making many other function calls just to build and send in a string object. So how does .NET clean all this up? Well, they actually did so in a pretty aggressive and very complete way. We no longer have to worry about IDL code, and we no longer have to worry about this limited set of data types that we have to stick to for all the different COM languages to understand. Nowadays, we have this much richer specification, which is called the common type system. And this describes in gory detail every single data type and every single programming construct that could be used by the .NET runtime engine. Now the cool thing about the common type system is that any .NET language can have any sort of different keywords that they want to represent fundamental data types or fundamental programming constructs like inheritance. But in the background, we're always mapping to the same set of rules. And that lets us do some pretty cool things like cross-language inheritance. You could build a C-sharp parent class and then reference that in a Visual Basic project and extend it. And we'll see how that's possible through something called SIL code. And another important feature that uh, .NET gives us is called the Common Language Runtime. This is another way that things clean up considerably. You might remember in different platforms that you've used in the past, it's not always as simple as just saying, here's my program. I'm going to ship it to the customer. You typically have to install different runtimes based on which language or platform you're using, right? Like Java has to have the Java runtime. Not a big deal. But then Visual Basic 6 has its own runtime. And the Microsoft Foundation classes have a set of libraries you have to ship along. Well, in the world of .NET, regardless of which .NET language you make use of, as long as the machine has the CLR installed, it can load up host, and execute your program. So given the CTS and the CLR, let's look at how this language interop cleans up. Okay, Here would be the proverbial hello world program. But I've created it using three different .NET languages. Let's give you a second to kind of look that over. Up on the top, we have a language called C++ CLI. And that's basically kind of Microsoft spin on the normal C++ language that has some new tokens and command line switches that enable .NET application development. Now in the middle, 
we have good old C Sharp. That's actually not Java, but it uh, has some similarities since they're in the same programming family. And then on the bottom we have VB, and that's definitely not VB6. Now again, without getting too hung up on the specifics, you can start to see some symmetry here, right? Like notice, for example, everybody wants something called system. They have a different way of asking for it, but they all want it. Well, that's what we call a namespace. And that's fairly similar to the idea of a Java package without the idea of a class path. And you can also notice how things clean up with our type system, right? A string is a string is a string. I don't have to worry about, oh, geez, you know, in this language I have to write a string this way, but in this language I have to write it that way. Behind the scenes, it all resolves down to the same object type, which is system.string. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.